Hi, doctor. Thank you for arranging everything. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Good evening to all doctors participating in one hour with the master, Maestro webinar. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Ruth Anastasia, and I'm going to guide this event tonight. First of all, we would like to say thank you to Sabang Merauke S Center, Indonesian Ophthalmologists Association, North Sumatra Branch, Indonesian Doctors Association, North Sumatra Branch, and Sunbe Vision for supporting this event. We are so grateful for the enthusiasm of the participants. And at this moment, we have almost a thousand participants from three continents. The speaker of this webinar is Prof. Steve A. Arsinov from University of Toronto, Canada. And the moderator is Dr. Gede Pardianto from Indonesian Ophthalmologist Association, North Sumatra Branch. This webinar will be divided into two sessions. The first session is an online course with the topic Immediately Sequential Bilateral Cataract Surgery. And the second session is the Q&A and discussion with the speaker. Before we begin this webinar, please pay attention to Indonesian national anthem. Attention, please, Canadian National Anthem.
We will begin the first session of this webinar shortly. Dr. Gede Pardianto, the time is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Ruth. Good evening, Indonesia. Good morning, Canada. Good morning, Steve. And good day for the rest of the world. It is near midnight, maybe in New Zealand and Australia. Eid Mubarak and happy holiday for all our Muslim friends from all around the world. Welcome to this international webinar that is attended by near 1,000 participants for, from three continents of the globe. Welcome to our program, One Hour with the Maestro. I am Gede Pardianto from Indonesia, and this is uh, Brahmasto Prasojo. Actually, he is my second child. The first one now goes to University of California at Berkeley, uh, majoring in astrophysics. And he is an incoming freshman at the University of California, Davis, majoring aerospace science and engineering. And like, just like you, Steve, uh, I know you are former uh, US student, right? Uh, because you were from Baylor College of uh, Medicine, right? And he will be my interpreter tonight in case I become lost in translation. And uh, for your information, uh, he was the youngest uh, speaker in 2018 World Ophthalmology Congress in Barcelona, Catalonia, Spain. This boy. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, uh, the maestro tonight will be Dr. Steve Arsinov. He is a legend, associate professor at the University of Toronto in Ontario, Canada. And this moment, he will present a very, very interesting topic with the title, Immediately Sequential Bilateral Cataract Surgery. Now, we are learning from the man who has 25 years experience in this particular procedure. This procedure is excellent yet super, super challenging. However, to be honest, I don't have any data how many person among us who has ever did this procedure in the last 10 years. So, calling please. Hafiz, calling. With, uh, yeah. Have you ever done simultaneously or immediately sequential bilateral uh, cataract surgery before? Please answer. And the answer is, yeah, 50% uh, among us. Okay, the second poll. How many times have you done this procedure? Okay, and the answer is, all right, all right, all right. People hasn't done it before. Yeah, 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 okay, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, no, uh, actually there is no official uh, recommendation from any official organization for this procedure to be a routine or regular or daily procedure. However, keep an open mind. Please pay attention to Professor Steve Lecture. What is the indication? What is the counterindication? What is term and condition? Please pay attention to how to aim the refractive result to obtain the good result how to mitigate the infection, how to deliver intracameral antibiotic, how to select the patient, and how to measure the cost of surgery, how to give informed consent, how to prepare operating uh, room, or how to prepare the right hospital and the right surgery setting for this procedure. Those all our ultimate attention tonight to perform this procedure to be safe and sound. Field of Thalmologists, let pay attention to Professor Steve Arsinov. Steve, uh, you are graduate from Houston, right? So Steve, time is yours. 
one, lift off. Let's go, Steve. Well, thank you very much. Let me just share my screen. It's okay, uh, Steve. It be sharing. It's okay. No, it should be sharing. One second. Oh. Okay. Um, can you see me? Can you see my uh, presentation? Hello? Can, uh, can you see me now? Not yet, not yet, Steve. The presentation is not on the screen right now. Okay. Um, sorry, for some reason it's not sharing this, one second. Can you see me now? We still no? can't see the presentation. All right. Can you see me? Can yes. can see you. Okay. So one second. It should work. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, it's working okay. now. Now you see? Yes. yes. Okay. First, uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, very much honored to be invited to do this uh, by Dr. Pardianzo. Uh, I put a picture of uh, or a map of Indonesia in the corner because, as you might expect, uh, Canadians aren't as uh, uh, conversant with all of Indonesia. And when you told me you were from Medan, I wasn't quite sure where it was. So I, I got a map and stuck it on my presentation. So when I look, I can see where I'm talking about. I checked a few things about Indonesia that your society is called Perdami. I have been there once before many years ago and I really enjoyed uh, coming there. I saw that your national meeting is coming up in September. And I wondered if you're going to have it or if like all the others, if it's canceled or going to be online. Anyway, so aside from that, which I'll find out as we go along, I'm gonna talk about bilateral cataract surgery because I think that COVID-19 has been a, a huge accelerator to change. And because of the requirements for sterility and cleaning, people are, are really eager to do bilateral surgery. So only half as many patients go through uh, the operating room and you maintain more sterility and less risk of infection and of catching the virus. So first, my conflicts, I really have none. It doesn't make a difference if you do one eye or two, your conflicts are the same, so it makes no difference at all. And then I thought it's interesting to look at the history of how we got to where we are. Uh, many people look at surgery and only look back for a short time, but it's interesting in the world that although the West seems to think that we're the smartest of everybody, that the first cataract surgery was done in India, as many of the things we've inherited, like mathematics, also came from India. Uh, and Sushutra uh, was the first to do this about 600 BC. And it took over 2000 years before uh, Daviel changed to extracapsular cataract surgery. Uh, and then just 200 years, which is relatively short compared to the first 2200, before Ridley developed intraocular lenses. Then we tried intracapsular surgery for a while. Then we went to extracap and extracap really gave birth to FACO, manual small incision surgery. And FACO is really what gave birth to uh, bilateral cataract surgery because the small incisions and the much more controlled environment allowed us to really lower our complication rate to where we could look at doing bilateral surgery. And then of course we get, went to FEMTO and now both FEMTO and manual small incision cataract surgery are moving to do bilateral surgery as well. So that's really how we got there. So I thought I'd first start off with a reality check because everyone tells me how terrified they are to do bilateral surgery because of the chance of bilateral simultaneous post-operative endophthalmitis. So we've actually studied this in our society and it turns out that most people in the world agree that if you follow the general guidelines of how to do bilateral surgery carefully, the risk is a little bit less than one in 100 million <clears throat> of getting bilateral cataract surgery, uh, bilateral infections. And most of those these days are actually now successfully treated. So it's not as big a disaster as people think it is. 
But if you look at the other things that we do, the risk of death from general anesthetic is about one in 100,000, which is a thousand times higher than the risk of getting bilateral endophthalmitis or bilateral cataract surgery. The risk of winning the biggest lottery in Canada, which we would all like to do, is one in 14 million. And that's about 7.2 times higher than the risk of getting endophthalmitis bilaterally. So you have much more chance of winning the lottery. And the risk of dying by driving your car on an American road for one kilometer, and the Americans claim their roads are the safest, is about one in 100 million. In other words, about the same. So if we ever go to the grocery store or go to the corner or go to our neighbor's house down the block, we're driving as far and taking the same risk as having bilateral surgery and possibly getting bilateral endophthalmitis. So the risk is really minuscule. And so we shouldn't really panic about risks in life, just compare them to other things that we always do. <clears throat> so when I look at bilateral surgery, people always ask me why I do it. Well, I'm really unaware of any publication and there have been numerous now, especially in the last year or two with everyone getting excited about bilateral surgery. And not a single paper ever shows that bilateral surgery is worse than delayed sequential bilateral cataract surgery. And if it's not worse, and most people write papers trying to show equivalence and not superiority, because when you try to show superiority, the journals give you a hard time in publishing your papers. So the, re the question is why I perform bilateral surgery is it, well, it's just better for the patient and it's actually better for everybody concerned. Um, and so I think it's great and I do lots of them and uh, I've been doing it for 25 years. So the next question to start on is, well, okay, if you're gonna sort of believe me and then say, okay, I'll consider doing bilateral surgery, when should I start? Well, the answer is you should start once every single little and large step of your procedure has been perfected. When you learn how to use intracameral drugs to dilate pupils that don't dilate well, and when you can manage small pupils in case they don't dilate, because if you try to do bilateral surgery on two millimeter pupils, it's not easy. Um, and you should learn to use OVDs and not just always the same one for every single case, but learn to choose different OVDs for different situations and make your surgery easier because you don't want to have stress in doing surgery of having a difficulty which you can get, get around with a better OVD. You have to understand your FACO machine or the procedure that you do for your cataract surgery extremely well, be able to change your settings, be proficient with all the things you're using and not be fearful that if somebody your nurse hands you something, you can't change it or adjust it to make it work better. You have to be good at IA. There have been a number of papers that showing that people often break capsules more often doing irrigation aspiration than they do during FACO. Well, you can't be one of those. You can't be the, a surgeon that breaks capsules often during IA, because if you do that, you're not gonna be happy doing bilateral surgery. You'll be very fearful of going to the second eye. You have to be very accurate in your intraocular lens biometry and choosing the lenses. You have to have a number of choices of lenses for your primary lens, for backup lenses, uh, for whatever situation might arise. You have to do this calmly and have an organized system to do it. And you have to be able to implant them well and have all the cartridges, if you use cartridge ones or whatever, organized and set up so that when you do them, every single case is actually not a complex procedure. You have to be good at using intracameral antibiotics and know which ones you want to use, how to mix them, how to prepare them, make sure that you don't get contamination and just have a good system. You have to make sure that your incisions are sealed and, and you don't have some of them leaking, at least more, you know, more than extremely rarely. You have to have an excellent post-op uh, drop protocol so that every patient you know you put on something and you expect it to work. And your follow-up routines have to be good so that you don't have patients that are lost in the, in the complexity of people coming back for follow-up or whatever. So once everything is set up, then you can start to consider doing bilateral surgery. So this is the first publication uh, for bilateral cataract surgery. And I was very nervous writing this paper because nobody in the world was even considering doing bilateral surgery. And I had done <clears throat> over a thousand consecutive patients. And so in 2003, I published this paper with Bonitia Geb and Yining Strub. And we talked about my first uh, 1,020 consecutive bilateral surgery patients between 1996 and 2002. And what surprised us in putting it together, because we didn't have electronic medical records, we went through every one of these charts, what surprised us is how incredibly few the complications were. And the complication rates, although there were little things like we had IOL power errors in a few because we only had uh, ultrasounds in and not the new modern machines, and we used SRKT because we didn't have newer equations. But there really were extremely few 
complications. And when we looked at the comparative literature of single eyes, we saw that our complication rate was maybe a quarter of what others were reporting. So we thought there must be something good about bilateral surgery. Um, so we thought we were doing great. And then we began to look around the world. And I found that the same year, uh, Bjorn Johansson from Sweden had published a paper uh, in the British Journal of Ophthalmology saying that they were looking at doing bilateral surgery. They'd done a much smaller series of only 200 cases, but nevertheless, they were starting to do patients and looking at it. The Finns were probably the first in the world to accept bilateral surgery as a country without sort of uh, criticizing your colleagues. And after about 2002, they were letting patients freely choose if they wanted bilateral or unilateral surgery. And in the Canary Islands of Spain, <clears throat> they were doing it pretty much always since 2005. And they took a different tact because they didn't want to have arguments among the colleagues. So they actually went to the government and they wrote an article of their experience. And instead of going to the medical journals, they went to parliament and they asked parliament to uh, create a committee and to review their cases, a committee of doctors, and then to either accept as a national uh, policy that bilateral surgery is okay or not. And the Spanish government in 2006 or eight uh, published this article and they said that as far as they were concerned uh, that bilateral surgery is every bit as safe and effective as unilateral surgery in Spain. And as a country, they accepted bilateral surgery routinely. And so it wasn't just me, there were other places. And then uh, I thought I'd tell you a bit about my experience, why I started doing this. Well, I started practicing ophthalmology in 1980s. You, most of you think that perhaps I'm a dinosaur or a caveman. But anyway, so in 1983, I was sitting in my office and in came this lady from India that had bilateral intumescent cataracts and pressures of like 40 or 50 in each eye. And she really wasn't doing very well. And she had come in uh, to Canada, brought in by her son uh, who had a business here. And he took her to a hospital downtown and they refused to do her surgery because they said she might have active TB. And at that hospital at that time, they didn't have any disposable tubings to intubate her because they wanted a general anesthetic. So he came up to my office, uh, not knowing me, basically crying that his mother would be blind in a couple of days. So I just took her to the operating room and did bilateral surgery on bilateral intumescent cataracts. And we put in, I think, plus 20 lenses, you know, something in the middle because we couldn't measure her then very well. Uh, it was a big crisis. Anyway, she ended up being like 20, 25, 20, 30 in each eye uh, with glasses and she was fantastic. So he probably referred me about six or 7,000 people after that and the entire Indian population of Toronto now comes to me because of this one case. And I did the occasional case, it was urgent like that. But then in 1996, in came another patient and she was this 45 year old young lady dressed very nicely, uh, looked very good. And it turns out that she races for NASCAR, the North American stock car uh, racing uh, tournament for cars. And in winter, she tests cars for Toyota in the northern tundra of Canada to make sure they can stand winter and minus 50 weather and things. So she came in, in in like early October and said, well, she has to be in Northern Canada in November and she only had one month to have both of her eyes fixed. Would I do it or not? So I said to her, well, you know, people generally regard bilateral surgery as more risky. And if you're willing to sign a consent and do this on and on, I was talking for about two or three minutes and she stopped me. And she said, doctor, do you really think that undergoing this surgery is more risky than my regular job of racing cars all day and driving to crash cars in the Northern Tundra? I looked at her and I said, well, no, the risk is nowhere close to what you do all day. So she said, so fix them. So I did her cataracts the next week. And, and when she came back the next day, I was surprised because I thought that, you know, she would be apprehensive and how is she doing and what's going on. But instead, the other patients were all angry with me because they said, why do you take this, you know, young girl and do both of her eyes and she can now go, go and work and do things normally. And I have to come back in one or two months for my second eye and I really can't function well until then. And that my patients were angry. And so I began to do more and more of them. And within a few months, I was doing two thirds of my patients or more as bilateral cataract surgery. So that's how I got going. So now I've been doing them for 25 years. I've done about 12,000 eyes. At least 80% of my cataract procedures since 1996 have been bilateral surgery. It's actually more, but what happened was in the hospital where I was working, uh, sometimes the government would not fund them for bilateral surgery. So I would do groundhog days. I would do right eyes on Wednesday and all the same patients left eyes on Thursday in the same order. So they really were bilaterals, but they were deferred by a day because of the government not willing to pay 
for patients in the hospital having it done uh, at the same time. I use intracranial antibiotics for every case, and I think that's a really important thing to do uh, because it really reduces the risk of infection by like 80%. And then uh, I used to use intracameral vancomycin until 2003, which I learned from Gimbel and Gills. And then they genericized it in Canada and the government forced us to use the generic one made in Toronto, which costs only $1 per vial, whereas the Lily one from the US cost $10. But the one made in Toronto was even warned, we were warned by the company that caused this task and wasn't safe for eyes. So we couldn't use it. So I used to go and buy Lily vancomycin in, in drugstores and bring it to the operating room and then in late 2003, the government told me I could not bring anything into the hospital that wasn't bought by them. So I, I got tired of smuggling it in and then I looked at different drugs in the world and found that Bigamox appeared to be uh, the best and safest drug to use. And I've been using that since 2004. And how I use it, I take 600 micrograms in 0.4 cc and I'll show you later how I do that. I've had now just uh, under 10,000 consecutive cases with intracameral Bigamox. And in the dose we now use, this dose, we've had zero negative side effects and no infections and no problems. So I thought we were doing great. And then uh, with the pandemic, there have been all kinds of webinars on bilateral cataract surgery, on intracameral drugs and various things. And I signed on to take part, well, I was invited to do so, uh, with one that was in French from Laval University in Quebec City. And this Dr. Marie-Ève Legaré is the current chairperson and I had spoken in Quebec City in 2013, and I did not know her then, and I guess she was in the audience. And beginning in 2016, all 16 of the ophthalmologists at Laval University decided they would uh, jointly take on bilateral surgery. And now they do about 60% or more of their cases, you can see over here, of 2019, has bilateral cataract surgery. And they're, they're going to probably catch up and surpass the number of cases that I do because they have 16 of them doing it all the time and I do it on my, so on my own. The interesting thing about this was first the discussion was excellent and they were all very uh, committed and they have found that bilateral surgery is better for their patients. But their infection rate is one in 14 and a half thousand, which is the lowest infection rate reported anywhere except by our bilateral surgery society, which recorded an infection rate of one in 16 and a half thousand which actually is pretty much the same because at that lower level, it's not a big enough difference to make it be anything but random. So they're doing very well, but we weren't the first. It turns out that bilateral surgery was first done by Jacques Daviel in 1747. He was very tired of looking at the terrible results of couching procedures, which was a standard procedure then. And he did the first cases as bilateral surgery. And actually most of his cases were done as bilateral surgery. And in 1756, he reported that he had done 434 extra capsular procedures as bilaterals, and of which 384 were perfectly successful. Now, having an almost 90% success rate compared to what the results of couching are is unbelievably good. And that's why Daviel is regarded so well, because it's probably one of the greatest steps after Sushutra uh, in really advancing uh, eye surgery in the whole world. Uh, and it took a lot of courage to do it. So we began to talk, the few of us in the world from uh, the, you know, Sweden, uh, Finland, Spain, and a few countries about bilateral surgery. We were talking in like 2003, and we decided to form a society in 2008. And we had a very small group, just nine of us, four from Spain, uh, two from the UK, one from Sweden, a Canadian, a South African. And here's a picture of us uh, at our first meeting, well, our second meeting, actually it was 2009, this picture. And two are missing. Uh, Bjorn Johansson, who took the picture, and Johan Kruger was late for the picture. Um, but that we had a pretty small society. Uh, but anyway, we our goal was to really try to make sure that as bilateral surgery spread around the world, people did it safely, because we were concerned of getting reports from here or there where there were infections or problems in different countries. And we were the ones who were trying to do it in large numbers and do it carefully. So we put together a document and we had one rule. And the rule in our society is that if any unresolved complication occurs with the first eye, the second eye should be deferred. Now, the reason we say an unresolved complication and not a complication, because what happens if you're planning to do a small capsulorexis and it goes out on one side and is a bit bigger, not covering the optic, or you have a small tear in the, in the edge of the rexis, but nevertheless, you put the lens in the bag and everything is okay. Well, that's really a resolved complication. 
Uh, or if you make the incision too big and it's leaking and something happens, but you put it back together and put a suture and it's okay. So those are resolved. But there are some like a broken capsule of dropped nucleus, it is not likely to be a resolved complication during the time of surgery. So we say that if you have an unresolved complication, the second eye should be deferred. But we also have noticed that the best time to do the second eye is immediately after you gain experience with the first eye, because every single eye you do has some peculiarities. And if you ask any bilateral surgeon, they'll tell you the second eye is always easier because you know exactly how the eye is going to respond and you do the case and it's just much easier. And so we think that the reason bilateral surgeons have a lower infection rate and a lower complication rate is because we do half the eyes are second eyes and, and they're easier. And it's very, very rare to have a complication in the second eye. So after a year, and we had everybody we could find <coughs> contribute to this, we put together this document, <coughs> which is called the International Society of Bilateral Cataract Surgeons, General Principles for Excellence in Bilateral Surgery. Now, we didn't like to write things like guidelines because we felt that was rather an arrogant thing to say, well, I know better than you do, therefore you should do what I say. But we thought we would put together the experience of all those in the world who've done, let's say, more than 100, 200 cases themselves, and put together their experiences and say what we think is safe to do. And this document has now become the global accepted document for more or less a standard of how to do bilateral cataract surgery. Uh, and I urge you to read it. If you don't have one, if you ask me, I'll send you one. It's also available on the ISBSCS website and on the I Foundation of Canada website. You just click on it and you can get it. Um, there are some of the things like posting data in the operating room and training staff that I'll go over as we go along. Uh, but I think every one of these points, like complete aseptic separation of the two eyes, are critical to make sure that you have no problems. So uh, as I told you, I started doing this in 1996, and it became known that I was doing it around 2000, 2001 and 2. And then I wrote the article in 2003. And I was invited to take part in all kinds of discussions and debates. And I remember I was arrested in Brazil because it turns out when I was lecturing in Brazil that bilateral cataract surgery was at the time illegal in Brazil. So they had an officer come and talk to me after my talk. And then the society said that I was a foreigner, so it was okay, so I didn't go to jail. And uh, I was invited to speak in Boston to the New England Society, which is the oldest society in North America. And they invited six litigation lawyers to sit in the front row and then give a talk about uh, how, how dangerous what I was doing was uh, after my own talk. Actually, it turned out they said it was perfectly fine. But I was, I was often being set up to be uh, criticized by various places because you know whenever you're the first in the world to do something, everyone gives you a hard time. So I was invited by both the ASCRS and the ESCRS to give, uh, take part in debates in 2014. These were surprising debates because as you can imagine, when you sit in front of an audience of four or 5,000 people, you try to prepare your talk pretty carefully. So I got up and gave my talk and I was always first. <clears throat> and then Ken Stiverson got up to give his talk uh, next. Now I knew Kent only vaguely because I had been to Colorado in 2003 where, where he was practicing. And I talked to his group about bilateral surgery and they didn't seem particularly enthusiastic about doing it as most groups that you go to in the beginning don't seem very enthusiastic about bilateral surgery. But he got up and told me that they were slowly doing a few cases. And at, at around 2012, they began to do more and the patients began to ask for bilateral surgery. And by 2013, the year prior to our talk, two thirds of their patients were electing to have bilateral surgery. And they said that the patients actually 80% choose bilateral surgery, but they hadn't quite gotten to the point where all the surgeons were comfortable. So they were doing two thirds bilateral surgery. So really his talk was complimentary to mine and not critical. And so we got along very well and we agreed on all the, all the points. And then after that, the next one was the ESCRS, which is in September, whereas the ASCRS is in April. So I went to Spain, the meeting was in Barcelona and Jose Guell, who you probably know is a famous ophthalmologist from Barcelona, who actually is against bilateral surgery. So I was more concerned about him because he's a well-known respected ophthalmologist around the world. And he's a very thoughtful guy. And I thought he would you know, find some points to criticize. So he got up and he went through all the literature and said that he doesn't do bilateral surgery. And he went through all the papers he could find. He said, but surprising to him, he could not find a single paper where the results of the bilateral surgery in the paper was worse than the results of unilateral surgery. 
And then he went through all the potential risks and said, well, you know, clearly the bilateral surgeons weren't doing people that had uh, coronal decompensation or severe fuchs or people that had systemic infections and, or, you know, terrible cases. And he thought the main problem we're actually going to have is that if we do people, they walk in, we do both our eyes in 30 or 40 minutes and send them home and they're okay. People already think in Europe and North America that cataract surgery and ophthalmology is trivial. And they'll really think it's trivial if we do it so quickly. Uh, but we discussed that after the, our presentations and we thought that, you know, patients thinking that our work is trivial, making it work so well, really isn't an excuse not to do better surgery. So he also really agreed with me in the end. So that was really very reassuring. So I thought I'd get criticized in both meetings and really worked out okay. Then when I came home, I was invited by this group, Help Me See, who's a New York-based group, actually run by this guy, uh, Mohan Jacob uh, Sazatu, who used to run uh, Orbis. And they were putting together a group uh, and techniques to be able to do small incision cataract surgery uh, in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of India um, very cheaply and efficiently. And they wanted to do bilateral cataract surgery. So I went to New York. They were making their own trays. They had everything manufactured in the US and prepackaged. So it was disposable trays. They said they could do the complete surgery in about five minutes for $50, 50 American dollars, which is really extremely cheap for the United States. Um, and they were doing amazingly well. And, and I've spoken to them a couple of times and they have been doing uh, surgery in sub-Saharan Africa and some parts of remote parts of India, like I think Bihar. Um, and they've um, really quite aggressive in doing it. And I think they're doing quite well. And then I met this guy, Sloan Rush. Sloan Rush, it turns out, is the son of Avery Rush. Avery Rush was in my class in medical school and he is from West Texas and he went back to uh, El Paso and started a clinic. And now his two sons, uh, Ryan and Sloan, have both joined him. And Sloan has been the leader in trying to figure out a way to do bilateral surgery in the American system. And he published this paper in 2015 showing that even though the Americans complained that they're only paid half as much for the second eye for the center, that he had it figured out so he could bring them in, save them transit, charge patients for a few things here and there. And then really he was said he was losing, let's say 20% on the whole thing, but he saved 15% in time. So in the end, it worked out close to even and they were doing a lot of bilateral surgery. And they published this paper about their experience, which was very, very good. And it was really a great pleasure to see my good friend Avery's sons uh, doing this paper. It was kind of interesting that the first Americans to adopt uh, my techniques were the children of uh, my uh, colleague in medical school. Among the various talks I've given during the pandemic has been <clears throat> with the International Society of Manual Small Incision Cataract Surgeons. I gave one to the uh, founding group uh, in India another one to the Egyptian chapter. And the webinars were interesting because they started talking about how you can change manual small incision cataract surgery uh, to make it as safe as FACO when you're doing uh, bilateral surgery. And clearly they're interested not just in making things more efficient and they might or might not save a bit of money, but mostly when you do people that are remote, you're lucky if they come back once. The chance of them coming twice uh, often isn't so good. And so a lot of the patients weren't coming back for their second eye. So in doing both together, they found that it was better and they were getting good results. So then <clears throat> that's the background. So let me tell you some of the pearls that I have in my experience of doing many years of bilateral surgery. There are a lot of reasons why people like it. And the first thing is that, you know, patients always come with their families because they're usually older and both the patients and their families really appreciate the fact that there are fewer visits. The patients really love the fact that you do them once, they're nervous before surgery, but the next day they can see in both eyes, they have no loss of binocularity, they can function normally, they don't fall over and get hurt and they can see well. And the families are happier because the daughter, it's usually a daughter or a daughter-in-law or a son, doesn't take six or 10 days off work uh, over and again to bring the patients back. They take off two days from work with a day of surgery, the day post-op, and they take care of their mother or father and that's it, they're on their own then. So it's much easier for the families and for the patients. They, the patients function much better. There's overwhelming preference for doctors, lawyers, refractive lens surgery patients. Anyone with a busy schedule is really much happier, not just racing car drivers, but everybody uh, having both eyes done at once and just going out and functioning normally the next day. Actually, I had a patient, I had a 
uh, a doctor from Sick Children's come in last week and she's really quite anxious about having surgery. <clears throat> and so I just asked one of the patients that I was seeing just two minutes before that I had just done bilateral surgery on to come in and talk to them. And so uh, he, he walked in and he said, oh, hi, I'm pleased to meet you. I, you know, I, I think I took my children to sick kids or whatever. And, and he was happy there. And, and so she said, well, what was it like having surgery? And he said it was easy. You know, he was nervous, but he, the same day he was putting his drops in, he was fine. And so she said to him, did you really go to work the next day? And he said, no, I went to work two hours after my operation because I was bored sitting at home. <laughs> so, so really, they, they recover extremely well. And then you have, you have much better acceptance of visual change. If you do high amotropes, either high myopes or high hyperopes or, or multifocal lenses, the patients accept the change in their vision pretty much immediately because both eyes see the same, they get bilateral summation and they just see much better. And there have been a number of papers that show that you get more improvement in your visual function after second eye surgery than first eye surgery. And I'm sure all of you have the experience of doing a cataract on someone and the patient is not as appreciative as you think they should be. And the reason I think is because you've broken their binocularity, even though you've made one eye see better. But when you do both eyes, they, they are extremely happy. We do people that we would otherwise be very cautious in doing. So I, I, these are among my favorite patients because these are people that really, really do better when you fix them. So I have amblyopic eyes. It used to be that we weren't eager to do amblyopic eyes because the prognosis wasn't so good. But now that I do them anyway, a lot of them ask me, well, you know, doc, I don't like the fact that my other eye has a white cataract or doesn't look good. Can you fix that one too? And I say, well, sure, once you're there. I said, I can't guarantee how well you see, but I can fix your eye and you know, make it structurally normal. It turns out that people with amblyopic eyes, once you correct their cataract and correct their refractive errors, a lot of them, six months or a year later, see like 20, 40, 20, 50 out of the amblyopic eye that they thought was the complete write-off. And they're really extremely happy because they notice that they now function with two eyes and not one. So it's much better for them. And then we have people that have psychiatric difficulties. This young lady is a bit schizophrenic. This lady has Downs. And she was being carried around by her father for three years because no one would operate on her. And this is how she was the day after surgery. Just she was lying there happy as anything because she could see and actually get up and walk around the room. And this young man has Duchenne dystrophy and they're now starting to live longer. But what happens to them, because they can't move their muscles, is they're confined to these wheelchairs. And so their, their bones atrophy. And he has to be moved from his chair with a special lift to avoid causing multiple fractures in his bones. And it takes about an hour to move him. So everyone's reluctant to do him. But in our hostel, we had this special lift uh, for people needing MRIs and things that, we, that were not movable otherwise. And we used it to put him onto the OR bed. We took an hour and a half to do him, a half hour put him in the bed, half hour take him off, and a half hour for the surgery. I focused one eye for far, one eye to read his iPad, and he was a 20-20 for both far and close the day after, and he was extremely happy, and so were his parents, who had to drive him 400 miles in a special van for his surgery. Um, and then I do patients that have otherwise very high risk, and people would not want to do because their life prognosis is not so good. Among my most interesting ones are people that are more abundant with terminal cancer. And some of them actually get cataracts from their chemotherapy and things. And the, the one thing they might do is read, but they can't do that either because they can't see. So I do them as bilateral surgery. We give them antibiotics and we cover them with systemic drugs sometimes. And they do fine. And they're happy really because they can function for the last few months of their life. And so why shouldn't we do that? So then next thing is you should follow these principles because it tells you how to do things safely. Be careful if you want to do bilateral surgery. We take a diagram like this with all of our patients listed and their axis and lens type we chose, the power and what the expansion and refraction is. And that's posted on the wall or now that we have all computers it's on the computer screen. So everybody in the room can see what we're doing. But what I do is I handwrite for each patient on a card this. I handwrite the measurements we've done for their eye what lens I'm going to do, what the axis of astigmatism is. So if it's a toric or whatever it is, I know for each eye what I'm doing. And that's stuck onto the microscope for each patient. And the nurses are told that when the circulating nurse passes the lens to the scrub nurse, she has to call out which patient we're doing, which eye we're doing, uh, what the lens is, if it's toric or not or whatever, and what we're doing to this person. And this, the scrub nurse, again, when she hands it to me, she calls out the same thing. And I look up at this little diagram and I make sure to confirm it's the right lens. 
So we've never made a patient. They made an error in, in 20 years, 25 years. Um, the operations are performed as totally independent procedures. Everything is changed except for me. So we change our gloves, our gowns, all the instruments, everything. And so the patient thinks we're leaving. We take everything out and come back with a new set of instruments to start over. Um, all the staff are trained to do bilateral surgery. They're trained in how the whole thing goes, the flow, so they're good at it. We always do left eyes first. And the reason we do left eyes first is if you always do everything in the same order, you make fewer mistakes. So if I did the worst eye first, one right, one left, the nurses would be confused as to which eye I'm doing and which lens to give me first. But if we always do the left eye first, there's no problems. And also in our operating room, it's arranged so the left eye is further from the door. So if they're gonna bring things in or take them out, I'd rather do the left eye than move over to the right eye because the phaco machine's on my right side, the tubing is there, and I don't have to put anything over the left eye once it's finished. So I do the left eye first, move over to the right eye, and nothing then crosses over to where the left eye is. And it's much safer. <clears throat> so then, do I have exclusions? Well, yes, everybody has exclusions. So in the beginning, I had a lot of exclusions. I wouldn't do diabetic macular edemas, but now the, a lot of the retina surgeons send me some of the worst diabetics. I just did one last week. My lateral is perfectly fine. Uh, and we do them and send them back the next week to the retina surgeon to get back to work on them and give them anti-VEGF or whatever. Uh, so they get better because, you know, when we started with our exclusions, we didn't have all the treatments we have for the diseases now, and now we have more treatments, and so we do everybody. Uh, I don't want anyone with an active infection, so we treat them for the infection. We don't want it. This is the one we still won't do. If you have fukes or a cornea more than 650 microns, we're really, really cautious about doing them because we don't want to have bilateral corneal failure for six months or so for someone after surgery. If it's a complex case, we tend not to do them bilaterally if they have severe phacodinesis, a subluxated lens. Uh, although I did do one guy who only could come once from far away. He had bilateral colobomas of his iris and lens, and we did the whole thing. We did his cataract surgery, put a ring in his eye, put the lens in his eye, sutured the coloboma, and fixed him up. He did one eye, then the other eye, but he was fine. He stayed still. And colobomas, he had like only about 15 degrees of missing zonules, so it really wasn't so bad to do him. But the ones that are worse, we're very cautious about. IFIS cases, I now do all the time because I've done so many. In the beginning, we were cautious. Really, it depends upon the surgeon's experience, skill, and confidence. So you don't do things as bilateral surgery unless you're confident that you won't have a problem. We clearly don't do anyone who has systemic sepsis. Uh, one lady was sent to me once and she had endocarditis, so we covered her with antibiotics because uh, she was uh, sick for a long time and couldn't see. Uh, children, well, it depends how old they are. Uh, often with babies, uh, at Sick Children's Hospital, they'll do them bilateral because uh, they do better like that. Uh, with, let's say, 12, 14-year-olds, we try to keep the better eye because it can still focus for as long as they can and do the worst eye only. Uh, and then there's the issue of money, which, well, in every country there's an issue of money because it's whether they pay you or not to do bilateral surgery. So <clears throat> what's happened to me over the past, well, it's now 25 years. Um, so we had to defer all the other six eyes. So the first one was because she spoke no English. And so her family didn't tell her she was having surgery and she was screaming during the first operation. So we canceled the second one and got a Punjabi translator who came in and I found out that her family hadn't told her she's having surgery. So we canceled her. Then we had one who had bad arthritis and she said her back was hurting her. She couldn't lie still for her second eye. We had a hundred year, year old patient with, who was demented with black, black cataracts. Her first eye, the capsule broke, so we didn't do the other eye. Then we had a demented male who became apneic after the, giving him propofol for his first eye. So we didn't want to do his second eye because we thought apnea was a good reason not to do bilateral surgery. Then we had a guy who lied to us who told us he was healthy by going to a walk-in clinic, giving him a note saying he was fine. It turns out he was a liver, liver failure. And Denise, just when he began to look at him and give him some drugs, was concerned about the fact that the drug that should not really do much really knocked him out and found out that he was in hepatic failure. And so we told him we weren't doing a second eye period and he shouldn't lie to doctors when he comes for procedures. I had a, uh, a gentleman last week who had really bad posterior polar cataracts and I canceled the second eye because and Mon, starting the first eye, he's one of those poster polar ones where the capsule is really frail. Even during hydrosection, the whole thing fell apart. So I did it okay. I did a, a nice capsulorexis, managed to capture the lens of the rexis, but I want him checked by a retina surgeon and things before doing a second eye. 
Um, so now I've only had to exchange uh, two patients' lenses, both of them before 2000 with only ultrasound. One was a high, two high myopes where the phobia is on the slope of the sapphaloma and two high hyperobes. Uh, we've had no corneas loss. We've had only one bilateral CME in a patient with retinitis pigmentosa, which resolved when we gave them non-steroidals and steroids. And I've had no bilateral detached retinas. So the risks aren't so high. So now our exclusions are reduced to borderline corneas and to patients that are infected. We do all of our femto patients now bilaterally. And we used to do femtophago, then femtophago. So right eye, then left, or vice versa, left, then right. And now we do femto, femto, phaco, phaco. This was pioneered by Laurent Laronde, who's in bois Quebec in 2014. And the reason is anesthetists often give patients drugs. And one of our patients actually, in going back to the laser, it's only 10 steps, fell over. So we thought that the risk of the patient falling greatly exceeds the risk of a problem with the femto in the second eye. So we've now done the last three or 400 <coughs> um, as femto, femto, phaco, phaco with no problems. And we found that in many of the cases, femtos work much better. So for dense cataracts, we do femtos all the time. For white cataracts, for moderate or severe silicone exfoliation, because it doesn't shake the lens around, just breaks it up. Uh, for fibrotic anterior capsules, for myotonic dystrophy, patients that have really super elastic uh, capsules, these people all do much better with femtos. And so we're happy doing them that way. So. So we're changing topics to antibiotics. All right, so a year ago at the ASCS, I was asked to give a talk on moxifloxacin. It was in San Diego, so I got dressed up as a pilot and I showed this picture, I thought it was kind of cute. And I got your attention. So I think it's critical that we use intracam antibiotics for every patient who's undergoing uh, bilateral surgery. We used to use vancomycin and I told you we stopped because of uh, the degenericized thing, but now Horv is a problem everywhere. And I think, in most of the world, people have stopped using vancomycin as a prophylactic agent. Um, cefuroxime is a good drug. It's been uh, proliferated and advertised by the ESCRS. The problem with it is that you get intracochal infections. And intracochal infections don't respond to the treatment because the drugs we use for endophthalmitis are drugs that are very similar to, to uh, cefuroxime. And so since they work by the same mechanism, they often aren't successful in killing intracochal infections. So when patients get these infections, many of them go blind. So I don't like cefuroxin. I like moxifloxacin. It's a dose-dependent drug. In the dose we use currently, there are really no bacteria that are resistant. They tell you about getting increasing resistance to moxifloxin, but that's resistance only with the systemic dose. The systemic dose is much lower, and we don't use that. We use a much higher dose inside the eye. And there have been really no significant complications reported from using intracamera moxifloxacins anywhere in the world. So do antibiotics work? Well, intracameral ones do. And in 2017, we had a big symposium. And at that time, there were about 7 million eyes in studies around the world, uh, all showing that the reduction rate uh, of infections were about one eighth what they were before. And since then, we've had Hari Priya and all in India published their 2 million eyes showing again that moxifloxin is very effective. And so now we're up to about 10 million eyes around the world in various studies showing that these drugs are very effective. Only two of the studies ever published showed they weren't effective, but the problem was those two studies came from Japan and they actually used too low of a dose. They used below the recommended dose, so that's why they weren't effective. I've been using this uh, since 2004, nine and a half, 10,000 cases to date, more or less. It kills everything at the dose we inject it and it works extremely well. Also, when you inject 600 micrograms, because of the volume being bigger, it allows you to position the lens because you, when you fill the bag, the lens becomes free to move around so you can rotate it better if you want to or whatever. It makes it much easier. So we published a series of papers and the point of these papers were to try to show how intracameral antibiotics work. The problem with dealing with humans is you really can't uh, take a biopsy or, or need an aspiration from their eye every 10 minutes. So we'd have to do it mathematically. <clears throat> so here we tried to build the first model and progressively build on the model. And here you show the resistance levels of different bacteria that are target bacteria at the horizontal lines. And this is the usual target bacteria, which is methicillin sensitive Staph aureus for endophthalmitis. This is the mutant prevention concentration. When a drug is above this level, 
you don't even get mutation or any problems with giving it, it kills everything. These are the two most resistant strains ever published in the world. There only were about five patients that ever had these kind these strains, but there were some, so that's the, the most dangerous ones. And when you inject intracranial moxifloxacin, the reason for the initial drop here is people often have leakage in the beginning. So we said, okay, let's accept the leakage that they had in, in a study in Sweden. And then from an hour eight out, we'll say that we have the normal drop you'd expect mathematically. And so we know that this drug lasts about 37 hours above the, the resistance of the regular bacteria, but only maybe eight hours above the resistance of the most resistant strains ever published. So what does that tell you? Well, not much by itself. So we went back and looked at all the antibiotics and tried to compare them. And then we published this paper, and this is the drawing that shows it. The curious thing is that both vancomycin and cefuroxime have the same MIC of the target bacteria and are injected in the same concentration, the same dose. So we can use one line for both of them. And if you take these lines and you shift them, because these two drugs are time dependent, and moxifloxin is dose dependent, and dose dependent fluoroquinolones have a post antibiotic effect, but time dependent drugs, as the name suggests, have to be around for a few hours to work. So you're looking at the concentration a few hours ago, not what it is now for it to be effective. So when you do that and you do all the math, you get these two lines the blue line for moxifloxacin and the red line for vancomycin and cefuroxine. And then you plot the same resistance ones the red for. Uh, Vanco and cefuroxime, and the blue lines for moxifloxin. And these arrows tell you what the ratio of what you have in the eye is compared to the resistance. And you can see it's twice as high for moxifloxin as it is for vanco or cefuroxime. And that translates into these two circles. These two circles represent the duration of efficacy of the antibiotic compared to each other. Now, some have told me, well, how do I know it's exactly 40 hours? Well, the truth is, in math, you don't. You calculate something, let's say we took the wrong constant. It could be 38 hours, but this is still half. The ratio is what matters. It doesn't really matter what the drop is exactly. So we know that moxifloxin is more effective than the other drugs. Next paper, which is in press now, <clears throat> is trying to figure out, is there any benefit of topical drops or oral antibiotics? Because most people in the world still use these. <clears throat> and so we looked at that mathematically and tried to figure out from all the papers published <clears throat> how much you get in the eye and does it work? One second. <clears throat> okay, so if you give intracameral moxifloxacin <clears throat> by itself in the orange line, uh, if you give topical rather, topical moxifloxacin, within a few hours, you get up to four times the mutant prevention concentration and it stays there for as long as you give the drug. If you give it in conjunction, the red line, with the intracameral dose of moxifloxacin, initially it makes no difference. And after about 16 to 18 hours, you get a slightly increased level compared to you, what you'd get with the intracameral dose, which is abating over time. And then it stays at four times the MPC for as long as you give the drug. Okay, fair enough. What happens if you give them every four, every six hours, which is a reasonable frequency, like four times a day or six times a day post-op? Well, you get these two jagged lines. So here's the uh, intracameral line, and here's the line you get if you give it six times a day, and here if you give it four times a day. And both of these two lines sort of jagged across the mutant prevention concentration dose. So you know, for as long as you get these antibiotics, you will stay at a high enough level to kill off the most, the normal uh, target pathogen, friendophthalmitis, but you won't kill off the two most resistant strains. It never gets high enough to be effective against those two uh, strains. So what that tells you is, if we look at all the graphs together now, if we give it every hour, you get a really high dose. If you give it, you know, but no one's going to do that. If you give it six times a day, it's not bad. It's above the MPC. Four times a day, it straddles the MPC. But it tells you that you'll sustain a level sufficient that you'll kill off the normal target bacteria for example, suppose the patient rubs his eye and makes the wound leak six hours later. Well, if you give him intracameral drugs, that'll be gone from the eye because he'll make it leak. But if you give topical drops as well for a few days, then you'll have enough to kill at least the most common bacteria. So it does have some additional effect, but not a lot compared to intracameral. And how about oral? Well, some people give oral antibiotics, 12 hours pre-op and then at surgery. So here's the dose given pre-op and where you are when you get to surgery. 
And then when you give them another oral dose at surgery, it goes up a bit, and then it comes down slowly because you have it in all your tissues giving it systemically. And compared to the intracameral dose, you see it has no effect for 24 hours, and then it's a bit higher because the abatement rate is lower when you give systemic drugs and when you give it intracamerally. So does that have any effect? Well, not much. The only benefit you're gonna have here is if the patient is systemically infected during surgery. So if a patient came and injured their eye, let's say in a car accident and had a broken fib tibula, fibula or somewhere else, uh, another problem to be attended to, you should probably give systemic antibiotics so it doesn't get spread of the systemic infection. Or if a patient uh, has um, endocarditis, like my patient did, I gave her antibiotics to cover her. But for just an eye in a clean patient, it's not gonna make any difference. How do you prepare it? I put, this is by the way, fluorescein. It's not that yellow, but I made it yellow so you could see it. So we replace the Vigamox with fluorescein and uh, you can use in North America only Alcons. I don't know which sources of drugs you have in Indonesia. I know India has a number of other manufacturers. Uh, the only generic that's been shown to be safe is a Sandoz one because a Sandoz one is identical to Vigamox. And you take the entire bottle and you pour it into a syringe. And then you add seven cc's of BSS. So it's seven plus three. And then you roll it in your hands and this syringe is diluted to the exact concentration you need. The circulating nurse goes and squirts half a cc of this onto the a little uh, bucket for the, the um, scrub nurse. She aspirates a TB syringe, puts on a cannula, gives it to me and I inject it into the eye. And you can't inject more than 0.4 cc's because that's all the room you have in the anterior chamber after surgery. So you always inject the same amount and it sterilizes the anterior chamber very effectively. And you have enough from one bottle for about 16 eyes. So it's actually quite cheap when you do this. <clears throat> okay, next pearl. Be suspicious of myths you hear. People who don't want to do bilateral surgery, usually because of money, will go and they'll make up a long story as why you shouldn't do bilateral surgery. And the most common one is, I'll get bilateral enough to my eyes. Well, I showed you that the risk of that is about the same as the risk of driving to the grocery store. It's not very high. <clears throat> and then they say, well, you get improved refractive results, but you modify the IOL choice after doing the first eye before doing the second eye. In all the studies that have been done in the world, and there are about 15 studies, it's just not true. It was true in the days of ultrasound only and not doing proper keratometry. But now with our lens stars and IOL masters, topography, tomography, new equations, it doesn't happen. So in all the people we looked at that do bilateral surgery, no one's changed the lens in like 10 or 15 years because you just don't get those errors. So it's a lot of noise about something that's just not a reality. So what about catastrophic complications? Well, I told you the risk of infections, unilateral infections in bilateral surgery is about between one in 14 and one in 18,000 versus the best reports of delayed sequential surgery of one in 5,000. Bilateral infections, we now estimate between one in 100 and one in 200 million. So if you follow the general principles of the society, the risks are extremely low. TAS, there have been no cases reported with the uh, bilateral surgery. You should not change anything in your operating room without the department and all the surgeons reviewing it to make sure it's safe. The TAS usually occurs when something has changed and someone brings in something cheaper that's not safe to use. CME, no cases reported. I told you the one I had was a patient that had RP, which you expect, and he got better. <clears throat> Pearl four. If you're gonna talk about this in published articles, use the terminology the society has proposed because that's what everybody in the world uses. I've been sent articles from the Journal of Cataractive Surgery where people chose their own terminology. And to be quite honest, you can't follow what they're doing. Often they mean bilateral surgery a week apart or a day apart or something else. If you use the precise terms, we know what you're talking about. Otherwise, your article will get rejected. And if you give a talk, the same thing. Try to use the terminology that everyone's accepted. So get a consistent drop regimen. Since 1990, I have not put a patch on a single patient's eye for any reason. I give them topical moxifloxacin, penicillin acetate, and ketorolac, and these are three mils, five mils, and 10 mils. So what happens is, the moxifloxin lasts about 10 days, the PRED4 lasts two weeks, and the Ketorolac four weeks. In Canada, it costs the patient about $80, uh, 20 to the patient, the rest the government pays. In the US, it probably costs 500 because the American drug prices are beyond belief. I'm sure it's also cheap in Indonesia. Uh, we give them two sets of bottles and I have the drugstore tape them together for right eye and left eye so they don't confuse them. 
We have them put in one drop of each six times a day for four days, beginning one hour post-op, including six times a day of surgery. Um, and then one drop of each four times a day until all the bottles are empty. And it works extremely well. And by giving patients drops, as opposed to trying to do dropless surgery, it does make the patients think that the surgery is more serious and they must take part in their care. And I think I get better results by doing that. I don't think I would do as well with completely trying to do dropless surgery. So then, so the summary is that the bilateral surgery aims to fix the visual system, not one peripheral receptor. I think I've talked to you about how it's better for the patient, it's better for the family, it's better for society, it's better for the insurer, whoever's paying the bill, it's really better all the way around. It requires complexity, uh, increased complexity and takes you time to organize for it, but I think it works better. <clears throat> so due to COVID-19 and cleaning requirements, suddenly everyone in the world wants to do bilateral surgery. I think I've done 25 webinars on bilateral surgery in all kinds of countries all over the world uh, when they want to start to do bilateral surgery since COVID started. So normally you can do 15% more cases, but with COVID-19 having to clean the room meticulously, you can probably do twice as many cases in a day as you can by doing unilateral surgery. So it saves money and it saves time. And numerous groups around the world trying to change the funding models in different countries to allow them to do bilateral surgery. So I'm often asked to talk about money. I don't think we should do medicine for money. We should do medicine for what's best for our patient and get paid for the work that we do. But I wrote a number of papers about uh, how much it costs to do unilateral versus bilateral surgery in Canada and all different countries of the world. So I'm often asked to comment. So I'm gonna have brief comments, one slide. I think it's appropriate to study the comparative costing and reimbursement of immediately sequential bilateral cataract surgery and delayed sequential bilateral surgery in different jurisdictions. It's interesting to see how different countries organize things and how we can recommend to them to make things better. I think it's inappropriate and perhaps unethical to choose to do immediately sequential bilateral surgery or delayed sequential surgery because one way you make more money than the other. But if they don't fund you enough to do it, then you're not gonna do it. I think it's appropriate for us to lobby jurisdictions to fund surgery equally and fairly so that you're paid the same whether you do the bilateral surgery or unilateral surgery. And that's the, the brief summary of money. So the conclusions are that you can now get the documents from the ISBCS either on the ISBCS Foundation or on the I Foundation of Canada where we post them all also. Uh, bilateral surgery is rapidly increasing around the world, spurred on by COVID-19. I'm sure you've seen in all the journals and throwaways, there's articles now on bilateral surgery everywhere. Follow the ISBCS general principles for excellence because you will do better if you follow those principles. If you don't follow them, there's a significant risk of having a problem. There have been eight cases of bilateral endophthalmitis around the world in the last 30 years. In just about every case, the, the guidelines weren't followed. Well, actually in every case, except one where no one knows what happened exactly. Uh, the risk of bilateral infection if, is high only if you don't follow the principles. If you're careful about following instructions, you do better. The need to adjust the second IOL power just never occurs if you follow modern technology and do things well. Money is the real issue and COVID-19 is really a monetary incentive to do what probably is best for the patient anyway. Thank you very much. Questions are welcome. Isn't that that? We're back. Questions? Okay. Abu, okay. Whoa, what a presentation, Steve. Thank you so much. Really cool lecture, Steve. Outstanding. Uh, Thank you. Okay, yeah. Field of Thermologies. Now uh, we are approaching the question and answer session. Okay. So I think uh, this is the first question that uh, really is interesting for Q&A box. Please, Mr. Translator. Okay, so this is one of the questions that we have gotten for the Q&A is one involving, see here, I have, 
do you also perform ICBS on complicated cataracts? Is there any exemptions? I've seen bilateral post EC end up with no access to spectrometry, and it, it and it certainly made me think the risk is too high. What do you think, Steve? I'm not I'm not sure exactly what you said, um, but uh, I think I choose to do bilateral surgery in anybody in whom I feel confident that I can do it safely. So as I showed you, my exclusions are decreasing and decreasing. It depends where you are. And I noticed in, in looking over Indonesia the last day or two, that there are a lot of places that do uh, small incision cataract surgery. Um, it would depend upon your facilities and the accuracy of your ultrasound and the patient expectations. So if you have patients that come from far away and you're not sure if they can easily come back, but if they come only once and you do both eyes, you can follow them better, you're probably better doing bilateral surgery. If you have patients in, in whom they want more accuracy, but you only have ultrasound or, or whatever limitations you have, uh, you may in some cases want to do unilateral surgery, although it might be difficult also to bring them back and refract them and change the power for the second eye. So it depends upon what facilities you have. You have to look at where you stand and choose what you think is safest. I know it's not a, it's not a precise answer, but you know, you know, in Canada, we're lucky. We have a rich country and I have all the toys in my office. So I measure with, them with, with expensive toys and it's quite accurate. So I really haven't had uh, any significant refractive surprise uh, for years. And I routinely expect if I do, let's say I'll do 20 eyes uh, on Monday, I expect that by Wednesday, they should all see 2020 with, with our glasses. And if they don't, something is wrong. So I don't expect them to see, you know, okay, we expect precision because we have the money to buy equipment to, to give us good precision. Is that a fair answer? All right, uh, the second question. Uh, now, now we have two questions that have the same themes It involve children. One of them is by Muhammad Adurauf is, is that what do you think about the bilateral pediatric cataract surgery for avoiding amblyopia? But inflammation reaction in pediatric is more reactive than adults. And additionally, it also, another question is saying that since you say children is not the exclusion, why does sub ophthalmologists do ICBS to avoid amblyopia in small children? Okay, there's actually two different issues altogether. Um, yeah. So the, the first one is if you get a very young child and you want to avoid amblyopia, I think more and more commonly people are doing bilateral surgery. And the one who impressed me the most, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, died a few years ago, but Jorge Villar from Mexico was doing uh, 100 or more uh, very young patients, less than a year old, uh, cat bilateral cataracts in Mexico City. And he began to do them and give them lots of uh, steroids to suppress inflammation. And he actually put in piggyback lenses with the intention of taking out the anterior lens when they were four years old or so. Uh, because the eye would grow and they would no longer be so hyperopic. I think that's an excellent thing because he avoided amblyopia. Um, he unfortunately died of Jakob Kreutzfeldt disease a few years ago, and, and I'm not sure what's happening anymore in that uh, institution in Mexico City. Um, but I think more and more people are finding that the risk of inflammation is not as high as the risk of amblyopia. And doing bilateral surgery is probably beneficial if you have a well-controlled environment and you can watch the patient carefully, make sure they don't get inflamed. The other issue was why I choose not to do bilateral surgery in let's say a 12 or 14 year old. When you do surgery on a, on a child or anyone less than 45, oftentimes the, their biggest uh, issue of being upset is they lost their focusing. They become presbyopic. And some people are happier being 2040 and not presbyopic than they are being 2020 and presbyopic. So I've taken a lot of people that have bilateral cataracts that are teenagers and they have a hard time functioning in school. And I've only done one eye. And if I could do one eye to focus far and see 2020, the patient can function well, can sit in the back of the class, can see. But when they want to read, in the other eye, the, the less severe cataract, which often is like 20, 40 or so, they can just hold things closer. But they can't do that if I do both of their cataracts. 
because uh, young kids, for example, she males want to play sports. And if you make one eye focus closer, one further, then they, then they lose some stereo. They don't play as well than hitting baseballs and various things like that. So you have to be careful in what you do with the kid to understand what their life is like. So I spend a lot of time in talking to teenagers about what they expect and what they want, because it makes a difference to them. Uh, and so that's what I, what I meant in the talk. It's not that I, I have done, I've just done, done a, one a little while ago, bilateral surgery, because both of them were fairly dense cataracts and the kid couldn't function. Um, and he, he didn't mind wearing glasses to read. Uh, and so that was okay, but you have to talk to them and see what they want. I hope that's a good enough answer. So there's two different questions, the very young ones with amblyopia and the older ones that are trying to function in society as teenagers. Uh, okay, Steve, well, uh, the next question will be, if you were a beginner surgeon, what you uh, suggestion for how to know our skill good enough to do the uh, bilateral surgery like this? I think the best answer to that is Michael Jackson's song. It's, it's the man in the mirror. You have to look at yourself during surgery and ask yourself, have you figured all these things out? Nobody can really tell you uh, how comfortable you are with every step in the surgery. So when you go and you do a capsulorexis and you're sure that you won't tear one out every two years, you're good at it. And no matter what the situation is, if, if you go and you do phacos and you know you will not break a capsule because you don't and haven't broken one in a couple of years and you're very confident, it's okay. If you can do IA and, and just expect that you're not gonna have a problem. So when you, and everything is worked out, you know that you can, uh, you have intracameral drugs, get the pupil dilated. You, ha you have all the various parts to your surgery. But if you're missing something, then I think you should work on that before you start doing a lot of bilateral surgery. Because if you try doing bilateral surgery and any aspect of your procedure is not well worked out, it'll cause you a problem. No question, you'll, it'll, you'll have to, a problem with it because when you do both eyes and if you do something not perfectly, then the patient is suffering from both eyes for a, a time post-op. All right, Steve, uh, the next question will be from Dr. Ferdian Ramadan. He is an ophthalmology resident in uh, University, Irlang uh, University of Airlangga, Surabaya. Please, Mr. Translator. His question was, how is the, what is the best management for congenital cataract pa patients who has undergone ICBS in order to control high inflammation reaction in children? Um. To be fair, I, I really shouldn't answer that question. Those, those children are, kids are managed here, the little babies in sick children's hospital in Toronto, and I don't do those cases. Um, uh, I guess you, you give them lots of topical drops and watch them, uh, but I think they require careful monitoring. There are all kinds of problems in kids that you have to do EUAs to check them well very often because they don't cooperate, you know, they're harder to do. Um, although we have, you know, uh, ceiling mounted slit lamps and things to so lie them down and hold them down and look at them. Um, but uh, I, I, I think it depends on your whole protocol. And if you can do one eye and you do it routinely and you're sure that you have a mechanism where it's okay, then you can do the second eye. And I think it depends on how you're organized and how many cases you do. Um, and you have to balance the risk of giving a general anesthetic twice with the, to do two eyes with the risk of they have for their eye. I know it's not a good answer, but you have to do each of these kids carefully independently. Okay, the next, okay, the next two questions are in a way related because it involves the the antibiotics that they use. One of them is what antibiotics do you use intracamerally for bi bilateral cataract surgery aside Vigamox? And the other one is asking about your use of moxifloxacin eye drop for ICP preparation. Aren't you afraid that some components in the preservatives could induce a reaction in the anterior chamber? Uh, okay, well, that's an interesting question. Okay, first I, I use intracamerally and moxifloxin or Vigamox, uh, which is the same drug for all of them. And I use, like I showed you, I use 0.4 cc's altogether 600 micrograms. 
uh, for pre-op antibiotics, I don't use any. And the first, Vigamox has no preservatives. Moxifloxin is the only drug that has been shown that nothing will grow in the bottle because the moxifloxin itself kills everything in the concentration of the bottle. So there are no preservatives in moxifloxacin. So you don't have to have an issue about preserved sensitivity. The issue really is microbiology. You should not give patients topical drops preoperatively. And the reason is as follows. When you take someone and you give them a topical eye drop preoperatively, what you're doing is you're killing off on the conjunctiva all of the bacteria that are susceptible to that particular drug. And, and bacteria replicate every half an hour. So if you give them this particular drug for three days, for example, what you've done is you've killed off all bacteria that are susceptible, but you've left a nice uh, nutrient medium for any resistant strain that happens to be in the environment to grow on the conjunctiva. So when you start surgery, the only bacteria that might get in the patient's eye are now resistant bacteria. So what you've done is you've actually increased the patient's risk of endophthalmitis. You haven't decreased it, you've increased it. So it's not a good idea. What you should do is immediately before surgery, within an hour before surgery, you give them betadine, a topical solution, and you wash their face with betadine. And then you give them uh, Vigamox, which is, it kills everything in the high dose. And you put the drops in three or four times before they go to surgery. And that will kill off all of the resistant bacteria in the environment that are there. In the only an hour before surgery, there isn't sufficient time for any resistance strains that might be there to replicate to cause any increased risk compared to how they were otherwise. So I don't give them anything uh, preoperatively. Only when they come to the surgical suite do we start giving them drops. And we give them all within an hour or 40 minutes before their surgery. Okay. Okay, thank you, Steve. The next question uh, will be from our friend from Kathmandu, Nepal. How many uh, severe complications do you have in your experience? Thank you. Well, I showed you there were uh, only those uh, six or seven cases where I, where I deferred one eye. And those were the only complications. The things you do see is you see the same complications that you see with anybody else. So if you do unilateral surgery or bilateral surgery, there is a risk of patients, let's say, detaching their retina afterwards. So the highest risk for detachments of the retina are between minus four and minus eight Caucasian myopes, males. So what we do with everybody who is a high myope is I have them checked by a retina surgeon if they have a past history of problems before surgery. And I have them checked again after surgery, two to four weeks later uh, to make sure they're okay. And the occasional one has had to get lasers. Uh, a number of years ago, maybe 20 years ago, I did have about three or four patients who detached one retina maybe four or five years after surgery. And that's when I began to make sure that everyone was checked by a retina surgeon. Since we've been checking with the retina surgeon, we haven't had, I think I had one patient who detached their retina, but that's just tough luck and not related to the surgery. So what else could you do? Well. I have the patients come back every year, the, these high myopes. And what I do with them is, you know, some of the patients don't have a posterior vitreous detachment at the time of surgery. And those are the ones who are the most worrisome because the vitreous is still attached to the posterior pole. When you put the artificial lens in their eye, which is only about a quarter as thick as a human lens, you're going to allow more space for the vitreous to come forward. And a lot of them will detach their vitreous uh, within a few years, a year or two after surgery. And that's when they have a risk of detaching their retina. And they also have a risk then of getting uh, pre-retinal fibrosis from, from uh, epiretinal membranes uh, on their macula from the PVD. So I look to see if they're getting a PVD and if their macula is okay. Uh, and then I ha look at their peripheral retina. And if I'm concerned, I send them back to the retina surgeon again. I haven't had many about whom I get concerned the thing I've seen that have been the biggest concern for me is that I've seen some patients five and 10 years post-op develop epiretinal membranes. Now, it may be that before we weren't all looking for those things and now I look for them and I notice them. It may be that patients live longer and we see them with these problems. Um, and I, I'm not sure it's related to doing the surgery or not because they would detach their vitreous sooner or later anyway. So, um, well, that's the answer. I, I check them all, them high myopes with retina surgeons. 
Uh, I've had very few post-op complications, but I worry about the retina probably more than anything else now. Okay, Professor, uh, we still have three more questions in the room. Uh, please, Mr. Translator. Uh, this is connected to the previous questions. During the time that you've done ICBS, how many percent incidents of you UVitis did you encounter when, when you're doing IS, IS, ISBCS? <laughs> Almost none. I, now, I had a lot of patients that had UVitis pre-op, but with the protocol that I treat them with, and particularly with giving them in the intracameral vigamox and also non-steroidals, I've had extremely rare, and I look at the OCTs afterwards, and I don't think, I think I can count on one hand the number of patients I've had with any uh, macular edema postoperatively, and they're usually diabetics. And so I just give them drugs for longer or send them off to the retina surgeon if they have long-term issues with diabetes to check them and treat them with anti-VEGF or whatever. Um, it's interesting that since I began giving intracameral bigamox, I haven't seen a single patient with post-op fibrin. I think the fibrin and the severe uveitis that we see is generally a consequence of low-grade infection. And I think that usually you can get over it yourself. Uh, your body kills off the bacteria. But with intracameral antibiotics, you just don't see that. And I'm honestly, in the last 25 years, I am giving intracameral bigamox, I haven't had anybody uh, that has had post-op fibrin. So, and you know, it's in 12,000 eyes. Um, so uh, I think inflammation is, is because if you, you know, if you uh, fake a part of the iris and if you get caught in the wound and you do a number of clumsy things that make the eye more inflamed, you have a problem. But if you're careful, you, you just don't see those things. It's interesting that we had a meeting uh, with Alberta and uh, Alberta is a province in Western Canada. And one of the doctors that I knew there, uh, Clement Hager, for many years, uh, we had a Canadian society starting in the 90s of cataract refractive surgery. And uh, I remember talking with him. We, we were always impressed with his results. And he gave a talk on his, on his 20,000 patient record that he had kept, the, the last 20,000 he did. And he said, you know, the incidence of complications he had in surgery with being very careful was really almost zero. That he, he might have a patient who detached their retina three years later or a patient that got CME, but it was always for another reason. And it wasn't because the surgery was bad. I think the more we get good at doing very careful surgery, the lower the complication rate, and you're not going to see a severe post-op inflammation. Normally on post-op day one, if you give them the drops like I do six times a day the first day of surgery, and you give them intracameral vigamox, you should expect to see very close to zero cells in their anterior chamber. And, and that's, you know, people tend to not, to not believe you when you say that, but if you try it, you'll see, you, you just don't get inflammation. The next question, Professor, thank you so much. Uh, which approach is recommended uh, as ICBS? Temporal approach or superior approach? And it's still <laughs> considered as uh, ISBCS is, uh, if the surgery done not in the same day. Thank you. No, ISBCS means immediately sequential bilateral search. It's done right after the other one. So the interval is like a minute or two minutes or five minutes. It's not two days. Uh, delayed sequential means it's done another day, uh, not, not right away. Um, what was the other oh, part of the question? How about the temporal approach and the superior approach? Oh, yeah. So I prefer actually, I, I must might be a, a dinosaur, but I prefer to operate on axis. And the reason is if I operate on axis, most people that are astigmatic have low levels of stigmatism. And I can correct up to a diopter or two easily by operating on axis and then just give them a spherical lens, which I just find much easier than giving them all toric lens and always operating temporally. And I'm ambidextrous and I don't really care where I operate. It's, it's uh, all the same to me. So I just rotate around the head of their bed and operate wherever the axis is. And I find it just easier. The patients see better. I don't have to use the toric lenses very much. And it's, you know, it's, the patients are happier. Thank you, Professor. So the next question. Let's go to the, to the next question is, 
when will we do a bilateral cataract surgery on both eyes? Do you have any criteria or any clues of which eye should we do the surgery first? You said to do the left eye first, right? Is there any information beyond merely habit that you recommend doing the left eye first? I do the left eye first because it's safer. Uh, if you always do the same eye first, you'll have a lot fewer problems. If you start doing the right eye then the left eye, um, and you go back and forth, one day the nurse will give you the wrong lens. It's almost guaranteed because you're, you're not letting them know what your sequence is. If you always do it the same, you won't have problems. Now, so then the question is, shouldn't I do the worst eye first? Well, when you think about that, the answer is, if you're gonna do both eyes, what's the difference? And if you do the less severe eye first, it should be an easier procedure. So in many ways, doing the less severe eye first is better for the patient because you have, in doing the first eye in which you're not familiar with the patient's eye, you will have a less likelihood of having a problem and you're better prepared for the more severe second eye. Um, so on the other hand, if it's the reverse, you're doing the worst eye first, do the worst eye first. So uh, there are good arguments for both ways, but the best argument is if you always do the same one first and you do the left one because usually all the phaco tubing and stuff comes across the right side. So you don't wanna have anything traversing over an eye you've just finished. So I do the left eye first and then just stay away from the left eye. Um, and it's better for the lens choice. It's just better for the procedure. And it's better for the nurses who bring things into the room on the right side. So if I'm doing the left eye, they're not bothering me. When I do the right eye, the left eye is finished and it's sitting over there and no one's touching it. So I think it's, it's just better to always do the left eye first. If your room is reversed and your left hand, you may want to do the right eye first, but it depends on how your room is set up. But I would always do the same eye first. Do you uh, still have time, Professor? Sure. There's so yes. many questions for you. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I told you as long as you want, yeah. Okay, okay. thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so next question is, they would like to ask if we don't have topography or lensar and the biometry that we use is immersion biometry with manual keratometry, can we still proceed with bilateral cataract surgery? Uh, yes, you can, but you have to expect that you will have some patients in which you have a higher chance of an error. And the highest risk will be in the high hyperopes, more than plus four or five, and the very high myopes. So the problem with the high myopes is the macula may not be right at the back of the eye. It may be on a slope of a staphyloma. And in which case, it's very hard to find that with an ultrasound. And so your risk of error is higher. But then again, I would. it depends on who your patients are. If your patients expect not to need glasses, like they do in Canada and the US, they all expect to be 2020 without glasses, then that's a, that's a bit of a concern. But if your patients don't expect to be completely spectacle free, and if you're using ultrasound, I would expect that a reasonable number of patients end up having to get glasses, um, then it's okay. So, uh, and the, the honest truth is in the whole world, the accuracy of our surgery is simply a matter of money. Uh, and, you, you know, we all criticize the Americas because America is a strange country. America is a country which only cares about money, or at least seems to the rest of us to only care about money, right? Ethics is secondary, money is first. But at the same time, their concern for money has enabled them to build huge corporations and to amass a huge amount of wealth, enabling them to have the best toys and the fancy equipment for everybody. So um, it's good and bad. And the rest of us in the world have gained from the American investment in making new gadgets for us to use and equipment and helping us do that. Uh, it's the same, all Western countries are similar to the same extent, but not as much. The British, the Europeans, the Canadians are also interested in money, but not quite as much as the Americans. And so we tend to benefit from having, you know, elaborate devices to do all of our measurements and, and a healthier, wealthier economy. Uh, everywhere in the world, you have to make compromises, including Canada, because we have national coverage and the government won't pay for everything. So we, we have to make compromises with, with money as to what we can expect and what our results might be. And so the less money you have and the less you invest in the newest, most modern toys, then you have to expect you will have slightly less accuracy. 
and you decide in your own society whether you're going to live with that and have some patients wear glasses or spend more and more money for more elaborate toys, knowing that beyond a certain point, as you spend more money, the return per thousand dollars is less because you can do very, very good surgery quite cheap. And you, you spend a hundred thousand more, it's a little better. It's not, it's not like phenomenally, but it's a little better. If you go and do all femtos and spend a lot more, it's a little better. It's not a lot better, it's a little better for dense cataracts, for you know, uh, subluxated lenses, for all these things, you get a little better, but you don't get hugely better. And in most cases, it's not much different at all. So is that, I don't know if that's a good answer. Okay, thank you, Professor. The next question from uh, Dr. Miratasha Julkarnain Kasim from Jakarta. After how many unilateral cataract surgery do you feel comfortable to start bilateral surgery? How many? I think it depends how good you are at unilateral surgery. I think if you're, you know, you're very dexterous and you're comfortable and you've done the research into intracal antibiotics and OVDs and how do you do this and how do that, you can probably after a few hundred start doing bilateral surgery. There are some places in North America and Europe where they actually teach bilateral surgery to some of the residents. Um, but I, I think they pick the residents. They pick the ones that excel in, in their surgical skills. Um, so I think it's individual. It depends upon the personality. And some people are naturally very confident in surgery and really that's their element. They love it. And some of them are nervous and they're not so good at it. You have to decide for yourself. I said, really, it's Michael Jackson's song. You look at the man in the mirror and you decide, you know, am I comfortable? Am I at a point where I can do this and, and expect to have very, very low complication rates? That's when you can do bilateral surgery. Not, not when you just think I've done 100 cases or whatever the number you choose is. Do you suggest uh, operating theater microbial culture to avoid endophthalmitis, Professor? No, I think it makes no difference. I think if you use intracameral digamox, it kills everything. Just make sure you put a high enough dose in the eye and the incision sealed. Um, unless you're in a, in a very strange place and you have very peculiar bugs, if, you're, if the cultures that you get from endophthalmitis in your jurisdiction are not much different from other parts of the world, then you have to expect the same results. But if you, if you live in a place where you're, you're growing exotic bacteria in the few infections that you see in your jurisdiction, then you got to be careful, look at what drugs you use. So we should all know what, what the endophthalmitis cases in our area grow. Okay, so the third one from the same person is, in the teaching hospital, we do not count the endothelial cell regularly unless during the primary examination, we found some abnormality. Do you think this is a must even for a unilateral surgery? Well, you see, it depends where you are. So in Ontario, where I live, in one of the provinces of Canada, the government has total control of healthcare. They decided many years ago, they're just not paying for endothelial cell counts. So nobody does them because you're not gonna go buy a device to measure them and, and pay for it and pay for your staff if you get, get paid zero to do it. So we do pachymetry. Pachymetry is simple, it's cheap. And all I said is if you, you're, the cornea is getting to be, you know, 640, 650, and you see fuchs dystrophy, then you better be careful and not do bilateral surgery. If the cornea is 600, it's probably fine. Uh, if you're careful and you use OVDs properly. But uh, we just do pachymetry and, and that's adequate to be, as long as you're careful and not doing cases that are risky. Okay, so moving on, this is a question from our YouTube live stream. Is there any special consideration in diabetic or diabetic retinopathy patients? Uh, yes, there is. So we used to not want to do them bilaterally. There was a risk of diabetic macular edema, making them worse, the eyes inflamed, all that. And then because I was the only one doing bilateral surgery, um, I began to get referrals from retina surgeons of really bad diabetic cases that also had dense cataracts. They said they want to go ahead and do the surgeries and treatments and they can't see very well. Would I do both of their eyes? And so I started doing them and then I began to realize, well, if I can do those people, the rest aren't so bad. So I began to treat them and I might tell a diabetic 
to take the, the package of drops I give them, the Vigamox, Acular, and steroids, to take it six or eight times a day for four or five days, rather than just four times a day after the first few days, uh, if I'm concerned about inflammation. And I might send them back to the retina surgeon a week later, or do an OCT a week later, do one before their surgery and check and make sure they're okay. By the way, we had a meeting uh, at the last ESCRS where we were talking about people doing OCTs of maculas uh, before cataract surgery. I don't know how it is in Indonesia, but I know in Canada, the government specifically doesn't want to pay for that. And so people weren't doing them. But we all began to talk about people that still have their vitreous attached and they're a high myopen. There's a very good chance of detaching the vitreous if you do uh, surgery on them by making the lens be smaller than their human lens. Um, there are patients who complain post-op because their vision is not that good. If someone comes to you and they have a 2100 cataract, uh, you may not notice a, an epiretinal membrane or something minor with their macula before surgery. But after surgery, the patient's seeing 20, 40 or so and doesn't see better and the patient's angry. So pretty much everybody at the meeting decided that, you know, it really is very useful for us to do uh, OCTs of the macula of everybody before their cataract surgery, so we know what we're dealing with. And I think that's reasonable because in surgery, the more information the surgeon has before embarking upon the procedure, the less likely you are to have a problem. So I do OCTs of the macula of every single patient I do, and I have done so for the last probably five years, uh, as it became more apparent to us to do them all the time. Um, so I, I think it's helpful. So if you're going to do that and you get a severe diabetic, I did a lady last week uh, who has had a panmental photocoagulation, has had some focal photocoagulation in her posterior pole from uh, hemorrhages and things that were a concern, and had been treated with intracamera with the uh, intraocular anti-VEGF injections probably five or six times in each eye for her diabetic macroedema. And the retina surgeon estimated that her best acuity might be 20. 30 or 20, 40, but she was seeing about 2100 and she really couldn't function. She's like 50 years old, couldn't function in her work. So he wanted me to do both of her cataracts. So she came in and I said to her, well, we can do them separately. We can do them together. She said, you know, doctor, I'm terrified of having surgery. Just do it together and get it over with. And I said, well, if I do that, I want you to take the steroids I give you uh, maybe six or eight times a day for a few days. She says, no problem. I just want to come in once, get it done and finished. So I did her last, uh, maybe five days ago, four days ago, and she actually called my wife, who's a distant friend, uh, this morning and told me that she's absolutely ecstatic. She can see 20, 30, and she hasn't seen so well for years and years and years. So why not do them? If you do them and you're careful, they, they really the risk is no different. If I had done her eye separately, she would have the same risk for each eye except she wouldn't have binocularity to get the benefit of summation of vision from two eyes. So now she's in focus for far for both eyes. I gave her, told her to buy some plus 2.5 or plus three glasses to read because her plus three, because her vision is not perfect. And she's doing great. I will leave her on the drops on non-steroidals and steroids, have her go back to a retina surgeon at two weeks, maybe give her another anti vedef injection and she should be fine. Thank you so much, Professor. Do you have any suggestion, uh, another mofluvoxacin beyond Uh Well, <laughs> do you have moxifloxacin in India? In in uh, Indonesia, sorry. Yeah, we have uh, another levofloxacin, uh, just like Trafit or ofloxacin, Tarifit, and uh, Gavorin, uh, and... Yeah, um, Molsin. The ones you have, are they made in Indonesia or are they from somewhere else? Gavorin uh, from Indonesia. From Indonesia? Yes. I honestly think that you have to ask the company. If uh, you sorry. ask them, if it's identical to Vigamox and non-preserved and you check it, it might be the same, but I don't know the drug in Indonesia. I know in India, there's a one that Oralab makes, which they use and is fine. And there's another one made in Mumbai that comes in syringes for single-use intracameral injection. It's also fine. And the other ones, I don't know. So, I mean, some of the companies will check themselves and make sure that it's, it's proper and it's safe and non-preserved and everything else. 
uh, and uh, you have to ask the company. How about gatifloxacin, Professor? Gatifloxacin is not good. It's, it's preserved and it has all kinds of problems. Um, I wouldn't inject that in the eye. There's only one series done by Donenfeld of 100 patients, which seemed, he gave a low dose. It seemed not to be toxic, but it was only one small series uh, okay. with gatifloxacin. Moxifloxacin is much better it's a, cause it, because it's non-preserved. Okay. Every one of the companies in the world buys the, uh, the drug from Bayer in Germany. And when they get it from Germany, it's okay, as long as they treat it well, dilute it well, and put it in the bottles properly. So if it's, if it's all done carefully, and you talk with the company and it's safe, then you're okay. But if it's not, like, you know, they did it at, at Aravind, they made their own order marks. So if they can do it, an Indonesian company can do it, any company can do it, as long as you make the effort of making sure it's okay. Thank you, Professor. Amid the pandemic, uh, do you have any suggestion to us about the additional examination uh, to prepare the cataract surgery, please? Uh, just what I told you that I would make sure, I don't know how many of you have IO masters or, or whatever things you use, but you want to do all the measurements as carefully as you possibly can. Um, and the same with the surgery. You want to make sure everything is laid out carefully. You discuss with your nurses. The nurses should understand how you do biometry so they can read your chart and tell you what lens are giving you so there's no mistakes. Um, it's, it's just, you, you do the same thing you do for one eye, but you do it carefully. And you the difference in doing bilateral surgery is only in that you are uh, crazy careful in making sure there's never any mistakes. So you're, you're really crazy with your nurses and making sure you do this, that, and the other. And it, like in the moxifloxin that I dilute, I make it with a nurse myself in the operating room in the morning. I don't trust a pharmacy to make it because if a pharmacy makes it, they will one day mix it in water. And water, as you know, is death for endothelial cells because they mix every other drug in water to inject for other places. Um, so I make sure that I do it with balanced salt taken from a bottle that we know is sterile in the operating room before we start surgery. Um, and I don't, I don't, get it anywhere else because I don't trust them. And I know you in the U.S. you can buy it from various pharmacies that are graded to be safe. Um, maybe one or two of them I might trust, but most of them I wouldn't trust. Most of the mistakes with drugs in the U.S. have been by having pharmacies dilute things and prepare them where they were not doing it as carefully as you might do it yourself in the operating room. But I think if you can do surgery and you're sterile, why can't you dilute a drug? You know, it's very simple. And if you do it and you follow the protocol I give you, and I can send you sheets of how to do it. If you, if you ask me, I'll do that for you. Um, there's no reason why you can't do it with your nurse. She's quite, everything else you do, you do with your scrub nurse, and they're quite good at that. And so why can't you do it yourself? Thank you, Professor. The next question is, do you change your surgical gown and spoon and instrument uh, after first eye surgery? Yes, we change everything. We change our gowns, our gloves, the Thank entire you. tray goes out. We get a whole new tray in. It's like it's a separate person. Okay. Do it as if it's another person. So actually, I've had some patients sit up and re get ready to go home. They think we're finished. And I said, no, no, lie down. We're just going out and changing everything. We're going to come back in a minute and start again once the room is all cleaned. Just stay there. But I've had two or three patients actually start to sit up and say, am I going home now? I said, no, no, stay there. Okay. The only thing that stays there is the patient. Everything else has changed. Okay, I understood. Plus. Okay, uh, last three questions. Uh, what kind of anesthesia that you usually use when you do immediate bilateral cataract surgery in patients without special needs? Uh, with all of them, we do neuroleptic anesthesia. So um, every country is different, all right? But in Canada, fortunately for us, people live a long time. And I have lots of patients that are 80, 90 years old. People that are that old tend not to be healthy and they tend to be frail. So um, I like to make sure I have an anesthetist around to check them. So we get a, a letter from their doctor and they tend to vary in how good they are. Some are better letters, some not, but still the anesthetist checks them just before surgery, asks them what drugs they're on. And we, we already have a list and we check everything and we make sure they're okay. He then gives them uh, variations of neuroleptic anesthesia 
depending upon the patient's anxiety level. So the least we give them is nothing, and probably about half of the patients who are reasonably calm get nothing. And the most we give them is propofol. Propofol is a wonderful drug for patients that have a severe tremor or back pain or can't lie still or they're nervous wrecks or they're psychotic or whatever because it knocks them out for 20 minutes. But I would not give propofol without having an anesthetist there to watch them because you know it killed Michael Jackson. It's not a very uh, safe drug to do without somebody watching you. But I've had fantastic results with it. We've had people that are you know, completely uncooperative and rather than having to give them a general anesthetic, you give them a shot of propofol, you, you do one eye. So that eye is finished. Then the patient's waking up. You ask them if they can lie still. You start the other eye. They get crazy again. Another shot of propofol. And they sleep through the rest of the second eye. And, and it works wonderfully. But I would, cannot do that without an anesthetist. Uh, and so I'm kind of crazy in, in that I probably expect a higher degree of medical supervision than, than most ophthalmologists do but most of them don't do bilateral surgery and often don't do people that have you know, IFIS in both eyes and all kinds of complications and issues to deal with during surgery. And I want to make sure that my focus can be on the patient and not on them jumping around. And I can watch their eye. So half the patients get nothing. Some get a little bit of Valium or whatever, a similar drug. And the worst ones get propofol. All right, uh, the second last question. Uh, I have a question for myself at the end that I'll ask if you don't ask. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, can we use morphofloxacin intravenous for intercameral? <laughs> intravenous, you, well, you can give it intravenous, you can give it orally, it's the same effect orally. Uh, the problem is that the levels aren't nearly as high. And I showed you a, a graph of what happens if you give it orally. It, it really doesn't attain a high enough level to kill the most resistant strains you might get. It kills off the usual target bacteria, the methicillin-sensitive staph epidermis, but it will not kill off the most resistant strains that have ever been found in the world. I can tell you the most resistant strains have all been in Florida. Florida, for some reason, seems to be a haven for resistant bacteria. So I don't know what you have in Indonesia, but I know the one patient I had that had a resistant bacterium had just come back from Florida. Um, and they were probably carrying it on their conjunctiva in their skin when they came in. And they had a, a super high MIC, 300 times higher than the regular MIC of Staph epidermidis. Um, so it, it does, it's, you don't get a high enough dose intravenously. It's much safer intracamerally. And it really is non-toxic intracamerally as long as the preparation is good. So th the first thing I would do is as, as a society, I would go to the companies who make moxifloxacin in Indonesia and ask them if it's safe or if they can make sure it's safe. They can make sure that you get non-preserved uh, sealed vials of moxifloxacin to use for intracameral injection. There are a lot of people in Indonesia you should have enough volume of surgery to make it worth their while. All right, the last question, Professor. Okay, this question comes from someone who has done ICBCS as well. He, he states that he wants to do it by himself because he thinks that it saves more money, time, and has less stress pre-operative and shorter post-operative care for the patient. What are your opinions on, that, on those statements? Well, everybody has things that give them stress or make them happy. And we're all different. Um, I, I must say that when I started doing bilateral surgery, it was probably more stressful than unilateral surgery, but mostly because I was the only one in the world doing it routinely. And I was often criticized at meetings and I had to defend myself endlessly everywhere I went. So that was more stressful than the patients. The patients were generally uh, happy. And although Suppose you do someone and, and they have small pupils and you know it, it's, it's more difficult doing small pupils and I have a whole protocol of how I treat them and it works very well. But even so, the people may start to, to shrink uh, towards the end of surgery and I put in OVDs and I put in drugs and whatever and I find it works extremely well, but still it's a little bit more stressful. Maybe another step or so in doing a surgery. Um, if you do one eye, you, know, you finish the eye and they go home and you, you feel better. If you do one eye and there were some difficulties because of IFIS or whatever, then you have to do the other eye. And you say, oh my God, now another one of the same problems. 
And so it can be a bit more stressful. But admittedly, when you see them post-op day one and they can see well in both eyes, you feel a lot better. You know that that patient is over. Whether it was difficult in surgery or not, that patient's finished, they're fine. Take your drops, you're gonna be fine. So there are good and bad points about that. And it all depends upon our own personalities and our own stress level. Um, so I think it's okay. And I think for patients, patients are often more stressed in the beginning, uh, contemplating having both their eyes done, but they feel much better the next day because they're totally relieved. So I don't know if that's a good answer. So I have, I have my own question for me. And my own question for me is, what is the most critical thing to make sure that you don't share from one eye to the other? And the answer is, it's the OVDs. There's a problem with OVDs in the world. And I sat on a committee for 20 years for ISO to standardize OVDs around the world. It was very difficult. And it was difficult not because we we're incapable of making scientific standards. It's difficult because different countries make different OVDs. And every country has a right to take part in international standards committee meetings. Every country will lie to you to help their own businesses. So if you have, let's say, country X, it makes one OVD. They will give you a million reasons why you have to use their OVD, uh, most of which aren't true, but nevertheless, they, they're adamant that that has to be the case. So what happened with OVDs is they created a new sterility standard because some companies only filter their OVDs and they don't autoclave them terminally. Because if you autoclave, especially hyaluronic acids terminally, then you decrease molecular weight and you make it less viscous and it makes it less saleable. So a lot of them just filter them. And in the end, they accepted a bio burden, which is a risk of contamination of one in a thousand for OVD syringes. And their excuse was, well, you take it out after surgery anyway. So a bio burden of one in a thousand should be fine for OVDs. And they ended up passing that because there were so many countries that wanted us to accept an inferior standard. They wouldn't accept the one in a million standard, which is a standard for everything else in medicine. And so you say, well, is one in a million okay? But well, one in a million should be okay. And that gives you much lower risk of infection, a thousand times less. But if you want to sell baked beans in sub-Saharan Africa, the standard that an ISO accepts is one in a billion, a thousand times less. And the reason is that they often take those cases of baked beans flown in on planes from wealthier countries to places where they're having famines and they feed all the kids these baked beans because it's cheap protein. If one kid gets diarrhea, you're probably going to kill thousands of kids in some camp because they give it from one kid to the other. So baked beans have the toughest sterility standard of anything in the world. So OVDs, in comparison, are a million times more risky than baked beans. That makes us sit back and think, well, you know, gee, we put this in everybody's eye, let alone giving it to some kid to eat lunch. Now, if you're in a wealthy country and, you know, if I gave my kid baked beans, they got sick. So you give them some drugs, they're better a day or two, it's fine. But I'm not in sub-Saharan Africa in some refugee camp uh, with all these kids eating the same thing and playing in the mud with each other. So um, you have to look at the world. So my view is that if that's the case, you don't want to use the same OVD in both eyes. And what I do is because there are so many OVDs made in the world, I use OVDs that are the same, but from different companies in right and left eyes. And so I use uh, one company's OVDs for left eyes and another company's that makes the same or copies of OVDs that are almost the same for the other eye to minimize the risk. I've never had a problem uh, with the OVDs because what we take them out in a surgery, but there have been cases in the world where they've had to with, recall an OVD because of contamination or a filter broken where it's filtered or something happened with it. So I think it'd be most careful with your OVDs and do not use the same vial of HPMC, for example, in one eye as the other because you take an excessive risk. So that's, that's the main thing you have to be careful with. Everything else has less risk than OVDs. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Steve Arsinov, well known for soft cell technique. Wow, all 27 questions have been answered by the expert, by the maestro tonight. So, philophthalmologist, 
that's all folks. We learn a lot at this moment. Uh, this is very excellent yet uh, super challenging procedure. But remember, don't try to do the procedure without the special precaution and special preparation. However, don't be afraid to start, but please be wise and be careful. Please pay attention to detail. Do practice a lot. Do more practice because practice makes perfect. Because practice makes the impossible possible. Thank you, Professor Steve Arsinov for this memorable lecture and all the useful information you have shared with us tonight uh, in the morning in Canada. Thank you, yeah. Perdami. Thank you, ED. Thank you, SMEC Group. Thank you, Sunway Vision. Thank you, all the committee. Thank you, my interpreter. Thank you, all available participants uh, tonight. And back to Steve. Please send our regard to your family. We <laughs> Canada. Thank you. Any applause to our instructor tonight? What a presentation, Steve. Awesome. One skin. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dr. Pardiano. That was wonderful. Thank, thank you, you for so inviting much. me. Thank it's you. Been a, it's been a great pleasure to speak with you. And nice to meet you over Zoom. It's, it's interesting so that much. we meet people now across the world all the time. Um, and I learned yeah, something about Asia. I had, to, I had to look up where, where you live, and now I know where it is, and uh, yeah. check everything out. So it's and, a great pleasure to speak with you. Yeah, yeah. I hope I've been uh, helpful. There is next time uh, to make a more presentation with you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And if, yeah, okay. And, and thank you to our esteemed translator. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> And for everyone, see you on the next program of One Hour with the Maestro. Please keep stay healthy, stay wealthy, stay happy, everybody. Thank you so much. Then, Ruth, Thank you. time is yours. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. We have reached the end of this webinar. We really hope this webinar will bring benefits, especially in application of cataract surgery in daily practice. Once again, we would like to appreciate Sabang Merauke S Center, Indonesian Ophthalmologist Association North Sumatra Branch, Indonesian Doctor Association North Sumatra Branch, and Sunbe Vision for supporting this event. We express our deepest gratitude to Professor Steve Arsinov. Thank you so much, Prof. And for Dr. Gode Pardianto and all participants in this webinar. We would like to inform you that your e-certificate will be sent to your email after this webinar. We're looking forward to see you again in another webinar really soon. Thank you for your attention and good night. Thank you.